They have a regional accelerator that's going to have a uh, Sydney cohort here later this spring. And uh, great startups. Which is awesome. Yeah, we need some great startups, which we have been So I'm, I'm not worried about that. No, me either. But Peter's a little worried because we don't have any applications in yet. And I said, well, you know, for Spark, you get 95% of our applications come in on the last day. But we, we like to aim because I'll get on the phone with people and try and help them out a bit. That's exactly it. So if we can get if we can get applications in early, we can actually review them and start to get some folks help right away. But anyway, I don't want to steal your thunder. You're not. Um, no. <laughs> Wildly under <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it and a shot. I'm, I'm just going to turn the floor over to him. Okay. And he's got, he's going to do the presentation. We'll have some time for Q and A, and then of course yeah. the best part is uh, social. Uh, I've got a few door prizes, so make sure you get your uh, name in our door prize draw um, before before that happens, and uh, we'll let Peter do the, the first pick. For tonight. Cool. I'll, I'll try to I'll let you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a couple of things. I, I want to qualify who the top ten, what these tips would qualify or sort of aimed at. Um, so I work with first of all, I'm Peter Gifford. I, I'm actually based out of St. John's, but do a lot of stuff here uh, in Sydney most recently, um, but also in Halifax, in Fredericton, Moncton, uh, and Charlottetown. Um, so my my background is actually not in tech uh, or traditional software based technology. I'm I, I'm a naval architect and engineer by trade. Uh, and fell into this role uh, recently, uh, sort of about a year ago, and so I've been working with startup companies ever since. Um, so these 10 tips are aimed at very early stage startup founders uh, who might have a great technology background, um, but, but are looking to try and commercialize a product and, and are having a little bit of trouble doing that. Um, and, and so I've tried to keep them from being like, do something you love. Uh, and more focused on, because you should do that anyway. Um, and more focused on things that you can actually do. Um, and I've stayed away from specific tactical uh, uh, things that you can do, um, because I think that each company is a little bit unique. So I've tried to be a little bit higher level than that. Um, so I, this is, for me, the biggest one. Uh, and, and I think I'm going to explain it a little bit. But the, the first thing that we find that people who apply to our program do uh, or don't do is focus. Um, and focus doesn't mean like be single-minded and never shift your thinking. Uh, what it means is like choose one thing that you're going to work on, one problem. Choose a business model that you think might work. Uh, choose a customer. I said a customer, but choose one customer segment or customer profile um, that you like, um, and go prove that it works or doesn't work. And then once you've evaluated whether it works or doesn't work, um, and, and if it doesn't work, um, come up with a whole new set of uh, like. Look, take away the learnings that you've made um, and try and figure out what you would change about the assumptions you made and how do you retarget your product. Uh, okay, but the most important thing is that you're focusing. So like when you start listening to people pitch their startup and they're talking about the this that does this and it needs this to happen and over here this is happening, it's really clear to see that like it's hard for them to execute on all of those things at the same time. And so the most successful startups that I've worked with um, and that I've been lucky to work with are the ones that have focused on one thing to begin with, one in that particular segment, um, and have either expanded or just gone deeper in that one. So that's my that's my my shtick on focus. Um, so the next one is solving real problems. 
And, and what I mean by solving real problems is not that they're real problems to you, it's that they're real problems that a group of people have that isn't you. Um, so I, I think like everybody has got a problem that they really want to solve that would make their life much bigger. Um, but the thing about startups and what's exciting about startups is trying to find that problem that not just you have, that like a, a significant group of people has, um, where you can figure out a way to get that first customer, um, solve their problem, and then apply the same product or the same solution um, to another customer's problem and another customer's problem and another customer's problem. <coughs> So, so, like I said, solving real problems is important, um, but but it doesn't just it doesn't mean that it can't be your problem. It just means that you need to know that your problem applies to other people. This one came to me from uh, a good friend of mine who started Heyorka, which is one of the companies I got to work with, and his philosophy was that every element that you built inside of your product was making an, a metaphorical anchor bigger, and the bigger your anchor is the harder it is for you to be nimble and agile as a startup. And so for me, um, what I love to see with companies is um, a product and a plan that's a finite length. So like elaborate five year uh, business plans uh, might be really great for raising government funding. Um, but if you wanna be executing quickly uh, and, and spending time growing your startup, you may not need that five-year plan just yet, especially in the early phases. And the same is true for product. We get tons of people who are like, I'm in, uh, I'm gonna be really quiet about what I'm working on and I'm gonna work really hard uh, to make the perfect product that we've seen with the people that we've worked with is that that's not at all the case. Um, they don't, like, one, the product is never perfect. They, they never release it. They just have this plan to release and they could go through, if we run a four month accelerator and people are telling me in month one that they're gonna release in month two, it could be month four and they haven't released yet. And that's super common. So the, the reality is your product in software and in hardware is just never gonna be finished. You're always gonna be working on it and the bigger you make it before you release it, the harder it'll be to change when customers tell you there's a problem. So product and plans are like anchors, they slow you down, so you gotta build them up slowly and deliberately. Um, on the customer front, you have to call them. Um, <laughs> like actually get on the phone with them, pick up the phone, Find a customer and, and talk to them and, and get them to tell you what they're, why they're, why are, if they're paying you, why are they paying you? And what are they paying you for and what problem are you solving and, and how big of a problem is it for them? And do they know anybody else who might be a really great customer for you to talk to? Um, so it's, it's super important that you get out of your comfort zone. Like the number of startups that we talk to who are like, well, Pete, I use Google AdWords and Facebook ads, and that is how all my customers find me. Why would I get on the phone with them? This works. And, and my answer is twofold. Um, one, you probably don't know who your best customer is yet, and the reason you don't know is because you haven't gotten a chance to talk to them. Um, and so you don't know how big the problem is for them and how valuable this problem is to them. Um, and then the second thing is, it might be really hard to target that best customer because you don't know who they are yet. Um, we were chatting about it earlier with the guys from Protocase uh, this, this afternoon, and we were sort of saying, you know, like a company that has got recurring revenue and understands who their customer looks like can use Facebook ads because they're really great and you really can target people. Um, but if you're launching a product for the first time and you're just trying to figure it out, um, it might be really challenging to validate and prove that that customer that you're looking at is the right customer. So that's three. Um, I stole this one from uh, Paul Graham from Y Combinator, uh, and this is particularly true for early stage startups. Um, it's totally reasonable to do unscalable things, um, and there's a couple of really good examples that people talk about. So uh, when Airbnb launched their product, um, they were trying to figure out how to get uh, more people to buy rooms on their platform, and one of the things they identified was that the pictures that people were taking sucked. Um, and so because the pictures sucked, nobody wanted to rent the rooms because they looked sketchy and it's already kind of a sketchy service. So nobody was using their platform. What they decided to do was fly to New York, which was the area where they had the highest concentration of rooms. 
uh, and they offered a free service where they went and took pictures for people who were renting rooms on their platform. And in doing that, called them, they were able to meet the customers that they were looking for. Um, and, and so like, when you think about Airbnb today uh, and, and what they're doing, there's no possible way that the founders of Airbnb could go around to every uh, Airbnb location and take custom photos to make the, the listing look great. But in the early days, it was a platform, it was a, it was a tactic that they could deploy that worked. Um, and then there's some other really good ones as well. I think when Pinterest launched, uh, the founders went to the Apple store uh, and uh, reset the home pages on every Apple computer in uh, in the store, so that people would show up to Apple, see the Pinterest homepage, and be like, "Oh, this is so cool!" Can they do that today? Could they have paid to do that today? Absolutely, positively, no. Um, but at the time, it was a really cool hack, and so they were able to figure out that unscalable tactic um, that got them that early traction to figure out how to get customers. Um, and so I, I challenge everybody to kind of figure out with, with the startup that they're working on, what's that thing that you can do, um, which you know you can't do forever, but might work really well for now. Um, this comes from everybody who starts the accelerator telling me that they want to go talk to the equivalent of Bob. Um, <coughs> introduce me to a VC, introduce me to angel investors, introduce me to Money, basically, funding. Can we get like a cola, IRA, whoever else, right? Um, they, they are. So, everybody is so determined to raise funding or financing that they forget that they've got to build revenue. Um, and what I want to, uh, what we want to challenge people to do is think about building revenue first, even if it's like really small, inconsequential revenue that just demonstrates. If you do that and you do that repeatedly, guys like Bob are actually going to come find you. Um, so I think it's really important to build revenue first um, and then figure out how you're going to finance the growth over time. So on the topic of revenue, um, I think it's really important. Um, so met metrics in general and targets are really important. Um, when we think about when I when I think about targets, I sort of think, okay, well, this month I want to get one customer. And how am I? What am I going to do to get one customer? My one job. I'm the CEO. I want to get one customer. What am I going to do to do that? And if you set that target for yourself, it all of a sudden becomes the most important thing, and you start thinking tactically about how you're going to do it. But then once you start thinking about your targets and you start setting metrics for yourself, you can measure yourself again, measure your performance against your overall metrics. Um, and then when you look at that over time, you can start thinking about how do I do this in a more scalable process, right? How do I take this unscalable nature out of what I'm doing? How do I make, uh, how do I move from five phone calls to close a customer to three phone calls to close a customer? How do I take away the free trial? How do I do, you know, whatever it is that, that you're doing um, that, that is working now but won't work forever, how do, you need some metric to prove that, one, you can take it away and actually uh, see the timelines decrease, um, and two, that if you take it away, things don't get worse. Um, so I'm a big proponent for setting targets, and actually when people are going through the accelerator, we always make them set targets, um, and then we track their metrics through the program, because it's really important to us to see, you know, like, What's your uh, revenue growth over time? What's your, if you're a, a consumer facing app, what's your user growth over time? How frequently are people using your page? I, I think that's, that probably brings me to the, the next secret point. It's 10.5. Um, your metrics need to be really relevant. So um, Facebook is really famous for moving from num total number of users to daily active users because they knew that the value in their platform was eyeballs. Um, and that the only way you could measure your growth and attention would be to measure how frequently people were coming to your site. So it didn't matter if they had a billion signups. What they wanted to know is that a billion people were visiting the page every single day. Um, and so you, it's really important when you're setting targets and tracking your metrics that the metrics that you're tracking are not vanity metrics, page views and that kind of stuff, because it's easy to drive, drive those. Somebody says, I want to have a thousand page views. That's an easy thing to solve. 
but if you want people to like, if you want to have a thousand customers sign up for a free demo, that's a totally different a different ask. Um, so you just got to make sure that the metrics that you're setting and tracking are really meaningful to your business. Um, I'm, I steal this one from the sales guy from Hayorka. Uh, he believes that founders need to sell the product. Uh, I think Paul Graham thinks the same thing as well. He's a big proponent of the Paul Graham Y Combinator thing. Um, so founders selling the product doesn't mean that the founder needs to sell the product forever. Doesn't mean that that's the only thing that the founding team does. Um, but what it does mean is that in the early days, and likely for your first few sales, the founder's the guy who's dialing or growing. Um, and, and so what you're doing there is you're figuring out what your customers are all about. You're figuring out what segment really is going to work for you. Um, and you're figuring out what the strategy is that's going to work in the early phases of your startup uh, to get those early customers so that when you do hire a salesperson or a guy who's like or a guy or girl who's really good at, at sales, um, you can tell them what works and they can figure out how to make it better versus them going and you paying them to learn. It's way cheaper for you to figure out the, the learning bits. Any questions so far? Um, I think this is the last one, or second last one. Um, so the two things for me, I, I'm going to steal this one from Permjot. Um, so Permjot, for, for me, was always a big advocate of finding your community. Uh, and it's super clear that Sydney's got a community. Um, so that's awesome. And that you folks are all plugged into it. But I think that finding a community uh, and paying attention to people inside the community that you respect in terms of their business performance, you don't need to be buddies, um, but if you respect them in terms of their business performance and you want to learn from them and learn how they did it, one of the best things you can do is plug into a community and invest. Um, so I think as a founder, challenge yourself to invest in the community so that you can learn from your peers. I think the next really important thing is uh, putting together a small group. So like community is a big thing uh, and the, the quantity of investment that you can do is likely very small um, just because you've got a business to run and you've got to make sure that things are getting built and products and customers are coming in. Um, but I think you've got to have a really core group of uh, advisors, um, and, and I don't think they need equity. I don't think they need equity. Some people give people equity. Um, but I think you need a, a, a group of advisors who hold you accountable regularly to what you're doing. And so by that, I, and, and the accountability is more than just sending them an email every time something good happens. And I've, I've got a company that does that for me, and, and they're great. It's great. Every, like, anytime I get a message from them, I know that it's a good thing. I know that there's a whole lot of bad shit going on, but I know that there's a good thing. <laughs> so like today I got an email and it was like, an investor has is really excited about their company, which is fantastic. I think that that's great. But I'd also love to know about the shit that's happening in their business because that's where I think I can help. So if you go to the trouble of putting together an advisory board or an advisory network or a group of people who agree to have coffee with you once or twice a month, then share not only the good things, but the bad things and do it with a regular cadence. I think building a relationship with your advisory board that's like once a month, once a quarter, once every six months, if that's what you're into, like building that relationship with people um, and then leveraging that relationship will give you a ton of um, really big benefits. The one thing I would say is that, and, and this is particularly true for startup founders, is your advisor's probably gonna, you're gonna either outgrow your advisor or your advisor is gonna outgrow you. And that's totally fine. Um, so Hayork is a great example. Fabulous company. I helped them out a, a bunch at the beginning, but these guys knew how to hustle. And they also look, were like so invested in continuously improving their, uh, their own knowledge around startups and business and that. And so eventually I said, you guys are going to know way more about this stuff than me. Like, it's nice that you keep me in the loop. And thanks for the emails. And I'm glad that I'm part of, uh, part of that network. But, the, but, but you got to go find out who the next group of people is who can help you. Uh, and so don't be afraid to like fire an advisor or, or sort of take them into a slightly less important role. I mean, certainly still send them the emails, but maybe you don't go to them every two weeks um, for that deep dive on your business because maybe they can't do it then. Um, and it's also like if you're advising companies, 
Um, my comment would be, like, know when it's time to call it quits. And don't be afraid to fire a company that you're working with. And it's a good thing. The more companies that you can kind of say, yeah, like you're past what I can help you with in this particular segment, the better. Because you can get on and, and help another early stage company. Um, and so this is number 10. Shameless plug. <laughs> um, I, I think joining, and I'll be honest, I, I actually do think that joining, uh, personally, I think if my startup had gone through an accelerator, it would have been better off. We spent four years figuring out that it wasn't a great company. Um, and I, I think knowing what I know now, if I put it through a 12-week rigorous process, I might have figured that out sooner. I might not have, and that's good too. Um, but, I, but I do think that put spending 12 weeks investing one day a week in your startup in like the most in-depth and intense way um, can only be a good thing for you and growing your company. <coughs> um, we happen to run an accelerator here in Sydney, and so I think you should take a look at it. Um, but if you don't, if, if for whatever reason Propel is not a good fit for you, there's a ton of other accelerators that exist um, that are really well situated to support startups and really give you the kickstart that you need to kind of jump in deep on marketing, jump in really deep on sales, tell you how to do uh, telephone marketing. Like these kinds of really difficult skills that you know it's much easier if you don't have to figure it out on your own. Um, that's what these accelerators are set up to do. They're also really good at making sure that you don't make dumb legal mistakes, and dumb accounting mistakes, and dumb equity-based mistakes. Um, so like, Having a, a lawyer who's willing to sit you down and say, oh no, giving 30% to an advisor seems like a bad idea. <laughs> like that's, that's an invaluable thing. And if you're a first time founder and somebody says, hey, I can bring a ton of value, I'm just gonna advise, and I advise lots of startups and we'll do an equity deal. Like you might think that that's totally normal because you're not plugged into a community, because you're not an accelerator, you don't have Uh, necessarily the fault of the founder. It's just a, a, something that you want to avoid. Um, so I, my, my argument for accelerators is um, that startups are really, really hard, that you are going to make a ton of mistakes, um, but that if you can get into a group of people who are invested in seeing you be successful, that can only be a good thing for you. And that's it. Awesome. Any questions? I'll, I'll start. I'll start with some questions. Uh, where did you say that accelerator was again? Uh, yeah, so we're actually running it here in Sydney. Uh, okay. Actually, out of the out of navigate. Start if you haven't checked it out, I highly recommend it. Uh, how do you get in, and what's the commitment? Okay. Um, so you get in by visiting www.propelict.com/apply. Um, there's an application form. I think I you got it, Laird. You had a look at it. I think it's. Maybe 25 minutes. Yep. If, you, if you know what you're doing, you could do it in 25 minutes. If you don't know what you're doing, it might take a day or two. Um, and if you have any questions, you can always send me an email and I'll help you out. Um, so that's the application process. The commitment in terms of the program is one day a week. It's going to be here. We're not asking you to go to Halifax anymore. Uh, if we can get a number of really good startups, we're going to deliver it right here in Sydney from Navigate. Um, and uh, yeah, so. Uh, the way that it works is it's a full one day a week. Like you, every bit of one day, probably possibly nine to nine. Um, and what we're going to do is uh, it'll be a combination of time with EIRs, uh, time with local uh, talent uh, and mentors, and time with uh, a really talented group of speakers and facilitators from across Canada, and maybe some of the maybe some from the U.S. Who knows? Great. And where is that again? Yep, that's <laughs> happening right here. <laughs> I know you. You should check it out. <laughs> anybody is, has anybody thought about doing the accelerator and had any questions? Yes. Those are two different questions, though. <laughs> <laughs> thought about doing it and then been like, oh, I don't know if I should do it. <laughs> that kind of a question. If you do, uh, you don't have to say anything now. I'm sitting around, so I'm happy to answer questions. Anybody else? Any questions? No. Well, uh, thank you, Peter. No Peter's going to stick around for the night. Yeah, um, here he, he's here for the night and a little bit tomorrow. So if you wanted to uh, um, to hang out, 
he hasn't had dinner yet tonight, so after Tech Social, we're going to go to the Crown of Moose and have a bite to eat. You're welcome to join us there as well. You're on your own bill, though. I'll say that right after that. Uh, <laughs> so again, thanks, Peter, for, for coming. Thank you, guys. And, uh, we're really excited to be up. Genuinely, really excited to be here. Um, I, 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 I've met a few of the founders and people who've got really cool companies, and I'm super impressed by what's happening with St. Bob today. Like, I, I think there's a group of uh, technologists and startup founders who are really impressive here. I'm super excited to get to know more people. Excellent. Thanks, Peter. Thank you.